Hey calculus class, so today is our last topic of unit one, which is topic eight, continuity of functions and the intermediate value theorem. All right, so we're gonna start with a bunch of theorems about continuity, and basically all these theorems are, basic, are going to allow us not to always have to do the three-step um, proving process for the definition of continuity because somebody has already proven a lot of this. So the first theorem is if f and g are continuous at a and c is a constant, then the following functions are also continuous at, so function f plus function g is continuous. The difference of the two functions are also continuous. <clears throat> Some constant times a continuous function results in another continuous function. The product of two continuous functions is a continuous function. And the quotient of two continuous functions is also a continuous function. Just as long as the denominator of the bottom function does not equal zero. And the composite of the two functions. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this symbol, but this symbol is the same thing as saying f composed with g. All right, continuity of polynomials and rational functions. This theorem is two parts. Part A is that any polynomial is continuous everywhere. That is, it is a continuous on negative infinity to infinity. So if you can think of any polynomial, any quadratic, linear, cubic, etc. If you picture their graphs in your head, you should be picturing a curve of some sort with no discontinuities in it. Hence, it is continuous everywhere. A rational function is continuous everywhere it is defined. That is, it is continuous in its domain. So a rational function such as one over x is continuous everywhere in its domain. Well, of course not at x equals zero, but x equals zero is not in its domain. Therefore, the following types of functions are continuous at every number in their domains. So now if you are asked is this continuous function, you should be able to recognize yes because it's this type of function. So we already have polynomials, rational functions, root functions, so square root, cube root, etc. Trig functions, the inverse trig functions, exponential functions, and log functions. The next theorem is the composite limit theorem. So if f is continuous at b, and the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals b, then we can say that the limit as x approaches a of f composed with g equals f of b. In other words, if we were to take the limit of a composite function, we could actually take the limit of the inside function first and use this value to evaluate the outside limit. So this theorem says that a limit symbol can be moved through a function symbol if the function is continuous and the limit exists. In other words, the order of these two symbols can be reversed. All right, we're going to use this theorem to help us evaluate complicated uh, limits. So we have the limit as x approaches two of arctangent of x squared minus four all over three x squared minus six x. First thing is to split up the composite function. So determine what's the inner function and the outer function. So the f and the g. So we should note that the inner function is the rational function. The outer function is the inverse trig function. So we can split them up. <clears throat> we have arctangent x as f of x and this rational for g of x. Well, from the previous limits, we can say that f of x is an inverse trig function and x equals two is in its domain. 
So therefore, we know that f is continuous at x equals 2. So I was able to show that f of x is a continuous function just by um, knowing inverse trig and its domain. It doesn't matter if g is continuous at x equals 2. That wasn't part of the theorem. Thus, we can apply the composite limit theorem to help us evaluate this limit. So that means I'm actually going to take the limit of the inner function first and use whatever value I get from that limit and evaluate arctangent at that value. So I'm going to rewrite it so that I'm taking the limit of the rational function. I'm going to plug in 2 for x, and when you do, you should get 0 over 0. Uh-oh, we have to use magical algebra. So I have to do some type of algebra. Note, I am not factoring out at x squared from the top and the bottom. You only do that when x is approaching infinity. We're not approaching infinity. We're approaching 2. So we have to do some other type of algebra. So take a second and see if you can determine the type of algebra. Press pause. All right, so hopefully you notice that the top can be factored, difference of two squares, and the bottom has a um, GCF of 3x. So I can factor out the top and the bottom. And I notice that I can cancel x minus 2's, goodbye. And now I can go ahead and plug 2 in for x. First of all, I can simplify. Plug 2 in for x. Notice when I plug 2 in for x, the limit sign drops. 2 plus 2 is 4. 3 times 2 is 6. Simplify if you like. Now I can go ahead and evaluate arctangent at 2 thirds. You can totally leave your answer like this, that is totally fine, but if you're somebody who wants to plug this in your calculator to get the decimal, you should get 0 0.5880. And I'm not sure if I've made a note of this, but in AP Calculus, round to four decimals, four decimals, the AP test requires three, I require four, less likely to make a rounding error. All right, proving continuity. <clears throat> so we are going to prove that this function, sine inverse of x squared minus 1, is continuous on its domain and to state the domain of this function. So this is a two-part question, proving continuity and finding the domain. We're going to do the proof first. So we should note that this is a composite function. And we have that the outer function is the sine inverse, and the inner function is x squared minus 1. So we have two composite functions. We know that sine inverse is continuous on its domain because it is an inverse trig. And x squared minus 1 is also continuous because it is a polynomial. So therefore, we can say separately that f and g are continuous everywhere in their domain. Therefore, h of x is continuous everywhere on its domain because h of x is a composite function of two already continuous functions. So this is all that you would really need for a proof. The domain. So <clears throat> let's see how much we can remember of calculating domain. Since we have a composite function, that means that we are looking at the domain of the outer, which is sine inverse, so the domain is negative 1 to 1 on the closed interval. And the range of g of x must only exist somewhere on negative 1 to 1. So whatever we plug in to the polynomial, which we know is can, has a domain of an, um, all real numbers, whatever we get out has to fall within the domain of the sine function. So that means that x squared minus 1 has to be between negative 1 to 1. So what x values make the polynomial have a value negative 1 to 1? So I'm going to solve the inequality, add 1 to both sides, square root both sides, and we have a plus or minus square root 2 here. 
However, the negative square root of 2 is not in the range of g, so therefore we can exclude it. So our final conclusion, the domain of h is um, all x values between 0 and the square root of 2, including the endpoints. All right, famous AP style multiple choice question. I would be really surprised if there is not a question in this form on the AP test. So <clears throat> here is our example. Find the values of C, which C is some constant, so that the function, so the following piecewise, is continuous everywhere. And we are given five options. So we know that both pieces, so we got C squared minus X squared and x plus c are continuous everywhere in its domain because they are both polynomial functions. But we are not sure what is happening around x equals 2 because that is where the function breaks into pieces. So if you can remember from the previous topic when we talked about discontinuities, we could have a jump discontinuity um, at x equals 2 because it could be two separate pieces. So we do know that in order for a function to be continuous, the function must be approaching the same values from both sides. So this value and this value must be the same in order for it to be continuous at x equals 2. We want the c values that will help that make that happen. So plug in the x value for both pieces. So I'm going to plug x equals 2 into c squared minus x squared. Do some simplifying, so I get c squared minus 4. And I'm going to plug 2 in for x plus c to get 2 plus c. Since both of these have to be approaching the same value, our next step is to set both sides equal to each other and solve for c. So now it just becomes a basic quadratic equation. Get one side equal to 0, and hopefully it's factorable. Otherwise, you use the quadratic formula. So we have c squared minus c uh, minus 6 equals 0. It is factorable, so therefore c is 3 and negative 2. And from the choices, from the multiple choice question, you should choose answer choice c. All right. <clears throat> and our last theorem, the intermediate value theorem. This theorem says that f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b. So we have a continuous function on a closed interval. And we're going to let there be some number in, so some y value, between the y values at each endpoint, where the y values of the endpoints are not equal to each other. Then there, must, then there must exist a number c, so some x value within between a to b, such that f of c equals this number. So basically what this means <clears throat> is if I have a continuous function between a and b, where I have some constant in, where the y value is between the f of a and f of b. And since it's a continuous function, this function has to cross this horizontal line at least once. And the intermediate value theorem helps us determine that yes, it does at some x value that has to be between a and b. So using the intermediate value theorem, and this is the shorthand notation. If you don't want to write it out all the time, um, I use IVT. So the main purpose of the IVT is to show existence of roots or zeros of a function, not to determine what the roots or zeros are, but the fact that yes, there has to be a root between these two x values. The graph has to cross the x value at least once, so I don't know what the x value is. I don't care. I just want to show that, yes, it does cross the x-axis. So in order for a function to have a root or cross the x-axis, one endpoint 
has to be negative and the other endpoint has to be positive and it has to be a continuous function. So if it's a continuous function and the endpoints are opposite signs, the function has to cross the x axis at least once. So if we want to determine if the cube root of x plus x minus 1 has at least one root on the interval from 0 to 1. So you're basically checking the endpoints. You want to determine is this endpoint, the y value at 0, going to be positive or negative. So I'm going to plug 0 in for x to get negative 1. Then I'm going to plug 1 in for x to get positive 1. Now, of course, this only works if the function is a continuous function. Well, if you notice, we have a root function added to a polynomial. Therefore, um, we know that we have a continuous function. All right, back to the problem. Since we have a negative and a positive for each of the endpoints, we can say that since f of 0 is less than 0 and f of 1 is greater than 0 and by the IVT, so that's important, include by the intermediate value theorem, f of x must have at least one root on 0 to 1. All right, I hope you enjoyed uh, learning about the IVT and continuity and I will see you in class tomorrow. Have a good night.